much everybody for coming. We have, uh, uh, we're very privileged today uh, to have the SEG uh, uh, Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. John Dillis here. Uh, he uh, uh, has a, uh, a, a quite a history, earned his BS and master's degrees in geology from Caltech somewhere in the 70s, uh, and then moved on to Stanford University. So we both we both share that. So he's a, he's a cardinal. Or was it Indian back then? Cardinal. He was cardinal. Okay, good. Uh, but in the 1980s, worked as an exploration geologist in the western U.S. for, uh, um, for Hunt, Ware, and Profit and other companies. Uh, but, since, um, uh, but after that, he joined the faculty of Oregon State and has been, uh, let's see, that was 1986, and has been there uh, uh, ever since. And uh, he's part of, a, like I said, Distinguished Lecture Series from SEG, so he'll be talking about um, that important, uh, uh, about that important group. But uh, before that, I want to encourage people to um, come next week and the week after for we have, we're, we're stocked stacked, I should say, in October with speakers. So this time, this place, please come, continue. Uh, we have a, a catered um, a dinner right afterwards as well in 220 for those that want to interact with the speaker and other faculty. Uh, I don't know if we can have everybody there, but uh, <laughs> we'll do our best to accommodate. Let's just make sure the speaker gets food too. Um, but with that, I will uh, I'll leave it to Dr. John Dillis to uh, start us off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Yep. So, uh, just by way of introduction, uh, in 1986, my wife Anita Grunder, who was sitting there in the center, and I interviewed at Oregon State University. She got the job, so I was the trailing spouse for several years. <laughs> so. Uh, there's always hope, right? <laughs> anyway, rate, um, I'm pleased to be here. I'm the Thayer Lindsley Lecturer, and Society of Economic Geologists uh, funds the travel. And for that, you get this advertisement. Uh, if you're a student, you can become a member for 20 bucks. You get the journal. Uh, they have some interesting meetings every year. They sponsor sessions at GSA meetings and other places. And it, Next year, their annual meeting will be in, about this time of year in Santiago, Chile. If you students submit an abstract for a poster, they'll generally come up with half of the cost to attend the meeting, either the registration or the travel. Uh, they also have a, got a, a student mentoring group, and they run field trips for students. Uh, Bill Chavez at, at New Mexico Tech does those, and that students are carried for free. My, they have a large mining company endowment and they tend to like to encourage students. So if you're at all interested, it's a good, good organization and they're affiliated with people like Geologic Society. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. I've uh, only been to Chico State one time and uh, that was for uh, Nisa's graduation three years ago. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, some of the research we're doing, and this is the structural geology piece. And before we start that, we're going to do just a very quick um, uh, review of what porphyry copper deposits are. Okay, so uh, the talk you're going to get is a, a paper that Dick Tosdell and I have uh, written for a SEG uh, review volume, which is going to be a year overdue. <laughs> somewhere about a year from now it should uh, appear. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about porphyry copper deposits and then we'll talk about applying structural geology to, to porphyry deposits. It turns out that mineral deposits business doesn't do structural geology very well. And there's always a need for field geologists and structural geologists because they tend to drill vertical holes and forget that there are faults and post-mineral dikes and offsets by faults or tilting. Okay, so here's the world distribution of porphyry copper deposits, and you can see most of the ones are along the circum-Pacific, and that's related to subduction zone type magmatism. Uh, high down here is Proterozoic, uh, and there's a couple examples that are probable for porphyry copper deposits in northern Sweden, about the same age, 1.9 billion years old. So. Uh, when the atmosphere got oxidized and we started subducting oxygenated uh, crust, 
including probably sulfur, which is an important ingredient, ingredient in these deposits. We started getting magnetism that had a lot of sulfur, they oxidized arc magmas, and then we started getting these portrait copper deposits. Most of the ones down here are, are Cenozoic age. These are mainly uh, Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic up here. Uh, there's that, there are Paleozoic ones in central Mongolia, and these are the, the Tethian Miocene ones, and then a lot of young things down here, Paleozoic down here. So all three of the Phanozoic active plate tectonics, and we got these deposits. Okay, so this is, oh my god. <laughs> What did it do there? Okay, so here we go. This is uh, Bingham, Utah, which is just south of Salt Lake City, taken a few years ago. And that pit, that's two and a half kilometer diameter, they mined about 20 million ton metric tons of copper. Okay, it's about, uh, and something like 21 million ounces of gold, a lot of molybdenum. It's worth something like $100 billion. This is the reason that the Kennecott Mining Company Came to, it came to be a big company, and now it's one of the, the main mines of RTZ, the parent company. And this is my hometown of Corvallis, Oregon, and you can kind of see the footprint. It both tells you that there are important resources and there are huge economic environmental issues. So uh, mining geology involves both of those, and the future of uh, mining geology is building community relationships, environmental planning before mines, doing the mining, and then the cleanup side. And uh, it would be really nice if the US government uh, got its act together and, and uh, progressive plan. And we're still working under the mining law of 1872. Okay, so these things produce about 65% of global copper production. And this is, uh, this is before, oh dear. It's not like me today. Okay, so over here is what they mined, about 3 billion tons of ore. What they've mined in 100 years there is what the world is using in one year. Okay, 20 million copper tons of copper is what the world uses in one year. And we do not recycle very much. You'll know that because when was this building built? <laughs> I don't know. 25, 30. So the copper wiring in here is still here. The life of copper is a long time in wiring, which is the main use. And so as Asia has developed and, and, and there's been a huge demand uh, for copper. So this mine mines about 325,000 tons of copper. You need about 70 of these mining at that rate to produce what the world needs. And it had a huge landslide a few years ago off this side and shut it down for six months. The mines get deeper, they will quit being economic or close because of slope stability problems. Hence, there's a need to discover new deposits. Um, and I'll just comment that the global amount of, the amount of CO2 the U.S. produces, if you made, made it into some sort of carbonate, it would half fill that pit in a, in a year. Okay, so it's, uh, by comparison to our carbon dioxide use, this is actually kind of modest. There you go. Okay. Yeah, okay. So here's a cartoon that Dick Silito did years ago, uh, tops and bottoms of porphyry copper deposits. He wouldn't draw a stratovolcano today, but there's some sort of volcanic rocks. There's a deep pluton, porphyry dikes, for which they're named, and then this alteration where there's potassic alteration and then sericitic alteration. This has cape feldspar and biotite added. This has muscovite and lots of sulfides. Typically, the copper sulfides are on that interface, and they tend to precipitate from high temperature fluids coming out of the magma and making their way upward. So they're separating from the magma as it crystallizes. And we're gonna talk about how they get out, what's the structural geology part of that. And um, the gore grades tend to be about half a percent copper, sometimes up to 1% copper, and up to a few billion tons. The larger, largest resource known in the world is something over 100 million tons of contained copper in central Chile in the Andina Disputada district. Okay, and these ores form at anywhere from about two kilometers depth to as much as about eight or nine kilometers depth, and that's illustrated. I can get this to skip once, but it won't. Okay, it's illustrated here. Deep porphyry copper deposits, and we'll take a look at this later. This is Butte, Montana, and this is 
here in Peru, something like the ore zones are down at about eight kilometers depth, and the shallow ones, things like Bingham, if I can find that, it's over here, more like one to two kilometers depth. So this is the range. It's a huge crustal range. They're hydrothermal ore deposits, and they're coming out of mag, fluids come out of magnets, react with the rocks and precipitate to the top. And the little schematic is, this is the top of the granitic pluton, or cupola, and that focuses the fluids and the porphyry dikes for which the deposits are named. Okay. So we'll talk about that relationship as we go on. Okay, all right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about post outer deformation, how it helps us. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about magma sand, crystallization cooling, creation of fracture permeability by the magmatic hydrothermal fluids. Now, this is not too odd, obvious, but they're, the rocks over the magma chambers are plastic, okay? So, but at high strain rates, they fracture and allows the fluids to go through, and then we get large amounts of fluid that goes through that fractured zone. And then above that, above this brittle plastic boundary, there's convecting or advecting local meteor or saline waters that cool the hydrothermal system and they interact with the, the magmatic. Okay. And then the last comment will be on vein systems that go a long ways laterally and how that's affected by structures and permeability. Okay, so first part is post or juxtaposition uh, uh, deformation. So these are kind of valuable for us. We learn a lot about the architecture of the magmatic system and the hydrothermal system because in many cases, particularly in the southwest USA, uh, there's been normal faulting that have tilted plutons, they offset pieces of the ore body, and we get a uh, big depth interval. So the butte stuff is one example, but I'll show you that. There are also these problems, uh, they, the faults tend to offset or locally conceal ore bodies, and they've been exploration challenges uh, that in some cases have never been answer answered. Okay, so this is the uh, one I showed earlier. This is the uh, Juki Kamada deposit. It sits right there. This is the west fissure, and on the west side, there is another granodiorite pluton. It's not mineralized, and there's a piece of this deposit, which is the one of the world's largest deposits that was chopped off by the fault and is now gone. And the offset amount is about 35 kilometers. And as people figured out what that offset was, they did a lot of drilling and they've never found it. But this, this is actually true in several places in northern Chile. There are pieces missing by strikes left faults. And uh, it's been a challenge. So here in this case, probably, the 35 kilometers of offset is well enough known that they drilled the right place, but there was enough uplift on the offset piece that it's been eroded away. So that piece, they know the target, but it's not been drilled. On the other side over here, this thing is the Fortuna complex, and you can see the brown unit is the antenna granodiorite, which is then placed into a myelinetic shear zone, which is this kind of green thing ancient fault, it's a reverse fault, so that structurally was a structural control where the pluton was emplaced into a, a reverse fault system during the, the shortening in the Eocene, northern Chile. And then the younger plutons came in, which are these kind of yellowy orange guys here, and those are associated with the porphyry dikes, which are shown in red. There's some prospects all through here. Every one of those porphyry dikes has got copper on it, but it turns out this is a little too deeply eroded. You see 0.1 copper at the surface, and probably a kilometer above, there was copper in it. And if you go south, in the next uh, area on that south extension, it's not as deeply eroded, and they discovered four porphyry copper deposits in that area with about 40 million tons of copper. So this is the, the restoration of that piece we saw. That We saw this piece here, these deep, these porphyry copper prospects, this is the part that they discovered 40 million tons of copper in the, on the cover rocks to the pluton. And this is what we do when we remove 35 kilometers of offset of that west fissure. And you can see here's the reverse fault, and it shows up up there, and we match that 
that various units across the fall, restoring 35 kilometers. And on the other side, is this, this is the big El Abra Fortuna, El Abra side of the complex, and this is the El Abra mine, and this is the Anita or Concha Viejo prospect, which hasn't been mined. So this whole complex, when you fit it back together, is, is something in excess of 60 million tons of copper, all with one big giant plutonic complex. Okay, and it was started, their initial mapping was done by big, Baker and John Hunt of Anaconda in the 1970s. Okay, so here's another example. This is uh, a manuscript that Mike Sepp, one of our master students, just published in Economic Geology, and it's his best uh, attempt at taking the modern geology down here, where there are pieces of porphyry copper deposits exposed. He drew a cross section through it, and then this is this reconstruction to the original geometry prior to faulting. And you can see what it's done. The faulting is that the current deposit is kind of tilted on its side, it's sliced up by faults, and there are pieces of it over here that originally belonged up there that have been faulted off. And so this is in jungle in Panama, and the faulting and restoration means that this is the first attempt to, to restore those. And in this district, there's a lot of jungle, and there are probably pieces of the good deposits that are close to the surface that are hidden underneath normal faults like that, that have not been prospected. So structural geology, post-mineral structural geology deformation is quite important. Okay, um, kind of one final example. This is work that Bill Savas did. This is PhD at University of Arizona. Down here on the right are these, this, this is the Twin Buttes mine. Sierra Esperanza, one of the largest porphyry copper deposits in Arizona. Uh, the San Javier, and this is the Mission. San Javier is in here, and there's a complicated set system of normal faults. Some people call them detachment faults. And over here is the geology. You can see there's this big fault system. Uh, it's dropped things off of these rocks. This is the Ruby Star granite diorite, and that pluton that contains these things is the root zone, the feeder pluton that fed the fluids out, and it's been tilted so that the top is over that way. And he figured about 50, 50 to 60 degrees of southeast tilting of this ruby star grand diorite, about a north 60 degrees east axis like that. <coughs> so the bottom is over there, and the top is there. And here's the Sierra deposit. And Twin Buttes is over the top of it, and then faulted pieces of these guys. And you can see some of the dips of the of the rocks in that, that the pluton intrudes are deformed, so you can't really get the total amount of, of, uh, of deformation. This was done based on paleomagnetic reconstructions. Over here, you can see the estimates of depth, which were done based on Hornblende barometry, and so he got depths from about nine kilometers. Then there's a repeat. They found a fault here, and again from four to about 12 kilometers. So in this case, we see a cross-section through an upper crustal pluton, where you can see 12 kilometers into the crust, and you can see the deep granodiary pluton from which the fluids were extracted. And this is one of the arguments that uh, mafic magmas actually don't ever really make it to the upper crust to contribute metals to these plutons. They are present somewhere base of the crust or maybe mid-crust, but they don't transfer things like sulfur and copper into the silicic magmas in a shallow crust. And you can see this in a number of tilted plutons in Arizona. So they're, they're silicic plutons and they copper. There's enough copper in them to supply these giant deposits just by removing something like 100 ppm from the big plutonic body. All right. Okay, and then this is Yarrington, Nevada, where, where I've worked. The, this is the cross-section that John Prophet drew years ago, and this is how we restore it. Um, and you can see, we see from sort of upper crustal volcanic rocks over here, the, the andesite volcanic section, the pluton intrudes, and then locally we see the floor of the pluton, and the restoration is done by removing the first set of faults. There's a minor set here, and then the big set of faults, which are these gently dipping faults, and you can see the offsets of the 
a nimbrite section like that. This one, the Singazi fault, has about three kilometers of offset. So it's like a deck of cards, a label crust over, and when you restore it, you get the you get a picture of the geometry of the futon. This one has a cupola here with a dike swarm coming out. That's the Ann Mason deposit that Hannah and her students are working on. And then there's another one over here at the Arrington Mine with porphyry dikes. And there's always a problem with reconstructions, and you can see obviously what it is here. We can either restore the dikes, the vertical, which is probably the best reconstruction, or you can restore the dignumbrites, the horizontal. These are different 10 degrees. These are 26 million year old ignimbrites. These dikes are 168 million years old. So the, the solution is that actually when these things were laid down, the piton had already been tilted, tilted about 20 degrees. And then uh, that solves the problem. Because the paleomag suggests that current exposure like this have been tilted about completely on the side, 85 or 90 about 60 degrees, 65 due to the Loma fault, and an additional 20 degrees at some earlier time that we don't really can't document. Okay, so now I'm going to go a little bit to magma ascent. We've already started this a little bit with the example from northern Chile with the reverse faults feeding them up. So uh, feeding the magmas up. So these are things in western U.S. where we've worked a little bit, but the, this is the plutonic belt. And then porphyry copper deposits, some of them shown in here. The big district is the southeast Arizona and New Mexico area. And um, they're associated with hydrous arc magmas in convergent margins. And those have the cord blood bearing, so they have something like more than four weight percent water, they're water rich. In general, the overall tectonic setting is compressional, plus or minus strike slip faulting, like in the Eocene of northern Chile. Um, and with notable exceptions, there, uh, there are a few that are associated with extension, and the notable exception is the Bingham deposit, which is somewhere over here, and that clearly was under extension. But most of these deposits are in areas in belts of active shortening during magmatism. That may help the magmas not erupt, stay down in the upper crust and be gas there. Um, and uh, only places where extension is associated with this sort of thing is where the extension is quite mild, like at Bingham. So in cases of rapid extension, you're going to erupt the magma. Uh, and then if you don't form it, you have to degas the magma at depth. So uh, I'm going to come back to this as we go along. But uh, this, the, the idea would be that uh, you're under shortening. The magma can't get through, but the fluids do get through. So we want to talk about how that happens. And the argument is that degassing magmas, they make their own permeability. You never have to worry about having a fault there. It's completely different from shallow water deposits, where you need permeable lithology, sandstones, for example, or a brecciated fault zone to get fluids through. <laughs> but here, you don't, because the fluids will make their own uh, fracture system. Okay, so here's the magmatic setting. Uh, we have subducting upper uh, mantle and oceanic crust. It's full of water. It probably has a lot of sulfate, like hydrothermal sulfate. Um, got some chlorine. It, it uh, heats up. Those fluids come off. They metasonize the upper mantle, either asthenospheric or lithospheric. You make hydrous basaltic melts some sulfur and chlorine, and then in the mash or hot zone, it hybridizes, it partially melts, and then eventually what makes it up here are andesitic or basitic magmas, and these, these would be upper crustal magma chambers that crystallize and lose their fluids, and if there's chlorine in them, that chlorine will extract the copper and gold, and if it has sulfur, the sulfur will precipitate the copper as copper iron sulfide. So this is Jeremy Richard's little cartoon. There's several other ones. Um, this would be the cartoon where we're just emphasizing and exaggerating the upper crustal magma chamber. So <laughs> the magma ponds in the shallow crust result of some sort of density filter. More often it's probably just this. It reaches water saturation. 
via depressurization because water solubility in the melt is just principally a function of pressure. Okay? So if you bring it up, as it comes up, it starts losing water. And as it loses water, that means the liquid is temperatures of all the minerals that are anhydrous go up and you crystallize and that stops the thing from ascending. So you get shallow crustal magma chambers where they water saturate, which tends to be about two kilobar water pressure, uh, total pressure, something like six to six, eight kilometers depth. Okay, um, and then the other possibility is that where you have multiple intrusions, the early ones, and those would be shown here schematically as things that might be first plutons incrementally in place, as in Allen, Biosphere, and Company. And that's commonly what you see, like at Yarrington and, and El Abra, the first ones are lots of little dikes. They come in and freeze, but they're heating the upper crust. And by the time the ore forming magnets come up, the later ones, this stuff is all ductile. Okay? Now the quartz up here is above 400 degrees C, and it's plastic, and it's hard for this magma to send through it. Okay, and we mentioned the shear zones, like at Hill Opera. They might guide the magmas up, but one thing we don't really know is what, what allows magmas to come up. If you go in the Andes or, 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 or the U.S. Cordillera, you know, volcano spacing is a sort of periodic along the arc. There's some sort of fundamental structural control every 30, 40 kilometers. You have magmas. Okay, so the last magmas tend to be the ones that form these deposits, and it's schematically shown here as something that's convecting, and as it convects, it's cooling from its roof. There's a high point or cupola. We don't know how that forms. The most likely scenario is that sits over a place where magma is injected, so the hot magma sends to the roof. It melts its roof a little bit and makes a high point, and then as we stop putting magma in down here, this thing eventually lose heat through the roof, and it because of this water pressure issue, this is the lowest pressure, so it saturates with water, we form a bubble bridge top, and at some point it fractures. The, the roof fractures, either it, it gets buoyant, stretches its roof, and goes off, or a bit of hot magma gets injected, it lowers the viscosity, adds more fluid, and that causes something triggers this fracture. And I won't go into it here, but we have some evidence that suggests that, and, and the volcanology community has, if you look at quartz phenocris, they are look like they're remelted by injection of a bit of hot magma. They've been heated, and that's just before the, the dikes come up. Okay? And it doesn't have to be very much, it's enough to get the thing started. So once you make some fluid, if you inject some hot magma, that fluid cracks the top, the fluids go up, and then the dike follows that fraction. Okay. okay um, the other thing I'd mention is here is the sort of 400 degree isotherm. That's roughly the boundary between brittle crust where quartz is fractures brittly under sort of slow strain rates and down here where it's uh, quartz ductile deforms. So this area actually is hard to get fluid through. External water circulating out here, sort of schematically shown by these green or blue lines, will go through, they can get down to sort of 10 kilometers depth through fractures easily and convect and can be heated by this magma, but you can't get it very close to the pluton because there's always a ductile bone over the top. So to breach that, you need those fluids that go through. So I want to show you a little bit of evidence for that. Okay, so here's the here's the here's the northern Chile thing, and you can see uh, 40 kilometer spacings is kind of normal for the active arc volcanoes along the arc. This is the big um, uh, the Domeigo vault system that has a bunch of porphyry copper deposits along it. And the modern spacing of porphyry copper deposits in the Eocene is something like 40 kilometers in this belt up here. So there's two, there's the Chuquicamata, El Abra uh, deposits, and then 80 kilometers north is another set of them. So there's some sort of fundamental link between those. Um, and the spacing is dictated by something that's coming out of the uh, subducting, subduction and magma sent from the subduction zone. Okay, all right, and 
here's the, some details of that. So Chucky Kamada, El Abra, then there's a gap, and then this set. So there's a bunch of portrait covers, a bunch here, a bunch there, and then that one. And the belt has magmas. The big plutons are there, and here, and here. Uh, there may be some missing in this area that have not been found yet. So. And each one of these magmatic centers, we mentioned it earlier, but this one is the El Abra Fortuna one that we saw restored, has something like 60 million tons of copper and at least six porphyry copper deposits. This one has three big ones up here. Okay, all right, so here's the part about the water solubility. So here's water solubility over here. The ascending magma saturated with water on depressurization. Wayne Burnham called this first boiling. So at, uh, um, this is the water in weight percent and uh, at eight kilometers depth, depending on the composition of the magma, it would mean you have something like four or five weight percent water. That's about where we saturate it at something like six to eight kilometers depth. That's probably why the magma is on there. And then as they cool and crystallize, the solubility goes down, and that's called second boiling. And they cool through the roof. So in a magma chamber that's well mixed, if the crystal content is more or less even, then the area that saturates with water is up here. And so you can see what would happen. You get a volatile saturated roof, something triggers fracturing. The fluids go up, they hydrothermally alter the rock and produce some porphyry copper molly mineralization, and then the dike goes up and is in place along that fracture set. Just a sample of the magma. The dike actually doesn't inject. It follows the hyperfracture zone. It's expanding water-rich gas. And then when you lose the water, the process starts over again. You cool the top some more, and then it takes the next batch of fluid and the next dike, and then this would be a third one. So in uh, the Arrington mine, they mapped, they mapped six different porphyry dikes. There's probably a lot more. And the M.A. Stu deposit where I was mapping, there's at least three. That's probably more like a dozen. And it tell, those dikes are giving you tight lines for uh, crystallization of magma, degassing. And you see evidence of this in porphyry dikes will in the field of porphyry dikes and placed and they cut off veins from an earlier hydrothermal event. So you can see that's happened many, many times. Hydrothermal event associated with one dike, cutting that dike, the next dike comes in, cuts off the veins, gets cut by a younger vein, and that happens many, many times. In general, the, the copper ores, the highest grade copper ores are with the first dikes, and each successive dikes have lower amounts of copper we picked molybdenum, it's the opposite. So the first dike has the lowest molybdenum grades, and the last one has the highest. And as we crystallize this magma, the theory that Phil Candela and others develop is consistent with that. The first fluid should be very copper rich, high partition coefficient of copper between the aqueous chloride fluid and melt. And then the last one is molly rich because the first fluids don't extract molly very much the last melts get enriched in molybdenum. Okay, so, uh, and that would be the hydrothermal pattern. Places like Arrington is strongly vertically elongated like that. When it gets to the upper crust, it tends to spread out. And the porphyry copper molly mineralization occurs usually in from between about 450 or 500 degrees C to about 700. That's where the copper and molybdenum. And then the epithermal environment would be up here at more like 200 degrees, 300 degrees. Same sorts of things. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, I won't talk about too much about time scales, but the kind of the work that's been done in the last few years based on zircon geochronology of successive porphyry dikes, um, some diffusion time scale lengths suggest that uh, magma emplacement of an upper crustal pluton degassing it through a cupola of the megaor deposit is something like 100,000 years or less. Okay? And this is one model over here. This is 100, 
thousand years, and this is a model uh, that Anna Chopa and published um, uh, last year I worked on. And you can see that the, the, the period for the Lure Hill granite to crystallize and cool is something like 100,000 years. And we get that from thermal modeling of glutons. We get it from uh, diffusion time scales and zircon lengths. We're converging at something like 50,000 to 100,000 years for degassing. And in some districts, this has happened many times. So like the Yanacocho or El Teniente district, it's clear that we've had a magnet like this one come in every half million years for two or three million years. Each one's degassed, de and each one adds copper or gold or molybdenum. And so, but individual magma hydrothermal pulses are pretty short, and they're kind of hard to resolve within the geochronology This is kind of short for geologists. And the, this is the Arrington district. So this is the first incrementally placed, placed pluton, about 1,250 cubic kilometers. This is the next one at 200. These don't have ores. The last one is <coughs> roughly 100 cubic kilometers. It takes something like 100,000 years to in place crystallized gas. OK. So, um, so we'll talk a little bit. You get, get a phase diagram. This is the solubility of water uh, as a function of pressure and temperature. So that's soluble. So we'll go over here, temperature. And if we pick 700 degrees C, the temperature which the fluids are coming out of the magma. For quartz saturated magmas, the solubility is pretty well known. It's something like 5,000 ppm, so about half a weight percent silica. Um, and as that fluid comes up, it's, it's coming out of the rock, it's hydrofracturing, and it makes its way from lithostatically pressured scenario to eventually the hydrous. As that happens, it depressurizes. And Mark Reed and Brian Russ published a little paper. This is, the, this is this ascent path. It's kind of an adiabatic ascent path where it doesn't lose heat. And it fractures it way up. And as you can see, you can. These are the pressures. So it goes from two kilobars to hydrostatic pressure would be here about five, or five to 700 bars. And that will precipitate about 80% of the silica. And those are what we call AB type veins, the high temperature vein. These are associated with most of the copper and sulfide and aluminum sulfide mineralization. And there's this pink zone that most fluids, they go through this, and they actually, depending on the path they go through, they will dissolve silica in here, but if it went through this way, it would dissolve it in there. But there's not much quartz deposition. And then over here is the epithermal environment where you have quartz veins, and so it will precipitate quartz in there. So the thing that this guy, Bob Fournier, came up with about 20 years ago is that if you heat the fluid, convecting external waters that are outside the pluton, you move them toward the pluton, they heat up, and they're dissolving quartz. The solubility is going up, and then they enter this pink zone, which is the retrograde solubility area. So that means they actually precipitate quartz. And he called, he said that that meant the fracture is self-sealed, okay? And you can't really get fluids much above about 400 degrees C. It could be a little higher if we added salt to those waters. It makes it a little bit higher, but generally it's somewhere around 400 to 400. Okay, so this area over here, the, you, you, it's completely inaccessible to external fluids in a granitic rock that is, just has little fractures in it because the fluids will dissolve quartz and then as soon as it gets the retrograde, it seals them. And that seems to work pretty well. We don't usually see external fluids that get into the hydrothermal system that give you temperature pressure estimates that are more than about 400 degrees C. There are some exceptions. But that's kind of the limit. So that leaves it. This is this is the this is the ductile regime out here. And we have to hyperfracture that to get the fluid through, and because we have lots of quartz precipitation, as it depressurizes, you precipitate tons of quartz. That seals the cracks. Now we have a ductile zone over the magma chamber, and we can't degas until we get overpressures, and then it cracks it again 
new set of veins, and that happens many times, and that makes the porphyry copper deposit. Places where we have places quartz vein densities on the order of locally 1%, 2%, 5%, 10%, 15%. And that means enormous masses of water that go through, and it has to be over a long period of time and multiple fracture events. Okay, so this is kind of the scenario for how you would fracture it. So here's, here's before we have any fracturing of fluid. So here's uh, on this axis pressure, and this is depth, and this is a hydrostatic gradient, and this is a lithostatic gradient. And we'd be sitting at lithostatic pressures and, and some ambient crust, and then up here, hydrostatic. Many, most cases, the hydrostatic zone would be deeper than that. So if we have fluid that accumulates in the top of this bubbly magma, and you propagate it into a crack, it will, as it goes up, it's going to get overpressured because it follows its fluid. So the pressure down here is lithostatic. It follows a hydrostatic gradient from the crack upward. And when it exceeds the tensile strength of the rock, which is about 50 bars, it breaks and it propagates that crack. It will keep going up, crack, cracks it all the way up until, and you can see what it would look, might look like. And this is kind of a guess, so it's going to be, this is where it's cracking tip, cracking the rock, and it's propagating, it's going to go all the way up until it meets the hydrostatic zone. And you can see the fluid that falls behind it, ideally it would be hydrostatically pressured. It'd be coming out of the viscous magma, dropping the hydros to this pressure, and then cracking. And eventually, we get to this scenario where you have the fluid coming out of the magma, dropping pressure very quickly, into hydrostatic, and this precipitates the quartz, it seals it, and then we go back to that, okay? And the zone that's hydrostatic will, once you fracture the overlying rock, probably it's, a, it's lithostatic down here, and then hydrostatic kind of stays above about that line. So that, this cycle happens many, many times with each fracture event. Okay, so that, that gives us this kind of cartoon that we could think of. Here's an older pluton. Uh, this is this little rectal transition at about 400 bars. There's advection of external fluids that are cooling the magma down below. You're building up volatiles over here in the cupola. And eventually, it fractures its way through. But it can't escape until it overpressures, breaks through that ductal carolus. And here would be where it breaks through like that and uh, fractures the way through to pr produce porphyry copper ores. So uh, as it does that, it modifies that the fracture permeability of the rock above it. And what it'll tend to do is it makes lots of fractures in this rock. That allows external waters to get in. In the in Yerington, we get these brines that are sodic calcic alters. They get in, they cool the outer part of the pluton by compressing the ductal zone. And then above, in the upflow zones, it pushes the isotherms up. So we have actually ductal zones will extend way up high because it's transferred a lot of heat upward. So you get this kind of spiky pattern. Lots of external convection, cooling the hydrothermal system. But the center part, the only way we can get fluid through there is the hydrofraction, because this is high temperature, 400 plus degrees in the ductal zone. And that, the, the dynamic permeability has to evolve that way. So it's kind of an interesting scenario. Okay, so just show you some examples of hyperfracturing and how we know this might work. This is the El Salvador porphyry copper deposit in Chile, and uh, it has this radial and concentric set of pattern, uh, fracture patterns, and you can see the radial set of like This is a plug, it came in and shoving the rock out fluid pressure is high and it's cracking in a radial pattern. So the fluid pressure here is making tensional fractures like that radial. And then there's always a second set of fractures that's orthogonal to that one and you can see there's a lesser important set of fractures. Main one and then a second one. And this is around the L porphyry and uh, these are the pebble dikes and these are the D veins. Both of these occur in Sort of the hydrostatic regime just above the ductal zone. So that's one uh, that's one piece of evidence. And 
that we can see other things which are, and this is the example from Yarrington, you can see the porphyry dikes. This is looking west, and that's the fracture pattern. Makes these sheeted fractures that the dikes come into. Um, yet, if we go down to the source area, where they're come, these dikes are coming out of this magma, the lower middle granite, and you look along the top of it, there's no fracture pattern. Right? This is off the side of the cupola, to one side. All these fractures go through the top of the cupola. We don't have any fluid that gets out over here. The rock is not altered, there are no dikes. All the fluid accumulates at the top, goes through that, and that's what makes this common plot. You get fluid rock ratios along this that are more than one to one in aggregate. Something, you know, cubic kilometers of water have to go through a body that's about a cubic Okay, so this is the, the escape prep fabric of the, of the water. Okay, uh, we see things like this. This is the top of the El Abra Pluton, and it's the overlying rock is not fractured. We're off the side of the cupola, dipping about 20 degrees. There's a few little app-like pegmatite dikes. This is another example of a pegmatite on the roof of Pluton. That's what we normally would see. The dikes actually come from a little bit below that, and they would cut straight across that. And here's this contact. You can see it along like that. That's the top of this El Abra Pluton. And the El Abra mine is just to the right, about half a kilometer, where a bunch of dikes go through that. So it's a nice, flat, fairly gently dipping top. And one place on it, the high point, is where the fluid accumulated and the dikes and fluids went out. OK, so there's some other interesting things that happen. If you have a cupola, those applite dikes that went into the country rock, this rock is actually hot plastic. You put a dike in it with a lot of quartz, little applite dikes, and those are soft zones. And as this magma is making bubbles, it's buoyant, so it pushes up on its roof, and it actually shears those. And these are examples, these are myelinetic shears. The fabric is vertical sense of shear. So it's pushing it up, and it's shearing along the soft plastic dikes. So we can see this on the margins of the cupolas in a few places. Down here are some examples from the Schultz granite in Arizona. And you can see sheeted veins, which are these things, but they've been folded. Okay? So that rock has enough quartz in it. The hydrofractures fractured it, but quartz precipitated in there. And then it got bent plastically, because this rock is soft. So this is kind of this brittle plastic uh, transition. Uh, here's another example. This is from the E27 porphyry deposit. This is the monzonite intrusion coming into the fracture set. And you can see the really high vein density. This is the hydrofractured sheeted vein zones. And there's the monzonite coming up into it as dikes. Uh, and then you can see this is an example of a bike basaltic dike intruded into epiplastic rocks. It's going up and it deforms its wall rocks a little bit, and that's what this would look like. So sheeted fractures, and it's kind of a damaged zone above the porphyry stocks as the fluid is escaping. Um, most places you just see two orthogonal sets of veins, and that would be over here, like that, or over there, nice and cross cutting. That has to be multiple fluid escape events. And they tend to be orthogonal, but there's a few that are at odd angles. OK. And in places, uh, you can see things like this, where uh, that set of veins, you can see it's wavy. It originally probably was a straight fracture built in quartz, and the later deformation is deformed in ductile. So we see both the brittle and the plastic plastic deformation. Okay, and there's another one, another kind of wavy one. Here's here's one that's kind of been deformed. Here's pieces that are straight but offset brittly, but other ones that are kind of wavy deformed. So you see both of those phenomena, both brittle and plastic. Presumably all this is over 400 degrees C, and the, the estimates from titanium and quartz would also look like that. Um, from Bingham, Utah, and you can see this is the, the, the three porphyries, one, two, and three. This is the best mineralized. And the veins in there, you can see there's a predominance of one set of veins this way and another set that way. Typically, if they're orthogonal, not always. The predominant. 
and sets. And when you when you go away from the dikes, the fracture density diminishes. So when the fluids make the damage zone, the dikes come up those, and you can see here's Bingham Canyon, the uh, vein density and volume percent of the rock, and it drops rapidly away from the dike. And the same thing is true for the E26. So they, the dikes come up the fracture zone, and fluids are going out in front of it, so they're making veins, and then the dike comes up that path, and it comes up the zone of the maximum fluid flow. Okay, all right. Um, these are uh, from three different elevations in the, in the uh, one of the porphyry deposits, and you can see orthogonal sets, and then some places it looks like it's transitioning to a, to a more radial set. Okay, so uh, from the volcanic literature, this is what they learned, the micro seismicity that you get during magmatic uh, volcanic eruptions. This is, example would be Mount St. Helens or Montserrat, is that gas is propagating upward, it cracks, uh, the crack tip like that, and then eventually magmas break, go into that. And early on, it tends to be uh, set of cracks that follow one sheeted zone and with as magma gets in placed into it makes plug like thing then you kind of get random fracturing and cracking because it's more of a radial pattern so this thing has been observed in volcanic gases this is what makes uh, harmonic tremors in. okay so i'm going to finish with uh, the view district this is uh there are two porphyry copper deposits, one here and over there. These big ones are the main stage veins, and I want to talk a little bit about those veins. Um, we've done structural geology by measuring apple-like sills. Uh, they are sill-like bodies in the plant pluton, and these poles in the plains tell us that the, the, the pluton is upright, not deformed in the center of the district. It has a series of porphyry dikes. This one would be one, and you can see that the poles, the plains there, that tells you that they're steeply south dipping. And then over here are poles, the veins. Again, the veins are striking east-west, and they're steep, deepening steeply south. So this is consistent with uh, the Pluton host rock was flatlined, that's what we see here, and that during the emplacement of the veins and the, and the dikes, the shortening direction was like that, and the least principal stress was that way. Okay, so um, the main, that was uh, early dikes that would have been placed in hydrothermal veins when the rock was plastic. And with time, the, the, the butte district got exhumed, and there was a late vein system that cut through the district that were occupied by the main stage veins, these things. And you can see one set that goes that way, and one set that goes that way. And in the next photo, you'll see a simplification of that. This produced 10 million tons of copper. Uh, it's one of the great core deposits of the, of the US. And you can see the vein system is followed by the shafts. This is the Anselmo, the original, the east-west vein system of the, this would be the uh, Anaconda vein over here, which is the biggest one. Okay, so that summarized looks like this. So we see veins. This is the anaconda vein. The shortening direction looks like that, signal one. These are sort of tensional veins. Those veins are ones that are oriented east, northeast, and so they have dextral slip on them. The ones that are going this way have sinistral slip, slip uh, where John Prophet mapped them. The amount of offset is like a meter or two, not very much. So that deformation is localized right over the top of this porphyry system. And it's consistent with shortening that way and a little bit of extension that way. So here's a little cartoon of what that looks like. The first, the porphyry system, the early dikes and veins are in place, and those veins would be going east-west. And this is ductile crust. And then, as we zoomed it, we moved to, uh, I'm sorry, this is the ductile crust, current surface. We see the high temperature porphyry copper east-west. And then over here, we superimpose brittle things, and that's the stuff that has these, these 
these stripes that are normal faults at lower temperatures. This is less than about 400 degrees C, and this is greater than 400 degrees C. Oops. Okay. So that's it. Sorry to be a little late, but there's one important thing. I live in Oregon, and there's this fierce rivalry between the University of Oregon and the Beavers. It's completely <laughs> unimportant to anybody who doesn't live in Oregon. But we're the we are the friendly beaver, beavers. We also have a fighting beaver, but he doesn't look pleasant. And these are the fighting ducks of the University of Oregon. Those are the guys with the football team. We have the baseball team. So thank you very much. And found in the granitic uh, surrounding areas that are considered hot. If hot, you know, yeah. I've seen it and I don't hot. understand it, so I don't know. Okay. Milky quartz is stuff with lots of fluid inclusions and cracks. The blue is, I, I don't understand. Yeah. So, I forget the term you used, but at the top of the melt where uh -huh. it, it uh, uh, comes to a point with yep. the cupola. A cupola. Yes, what they have on Russian churches. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. It is totally it is like that's how I draw it. It's yes, yeah, rounded. Yeah. Um. How how wide or just you know, a general like how wide across are those cupolas compared to like where the dike forms usually are? Like, what's the ratio kind of? Uh, that's a good question, and it's one that's not easy to answer because in this, uh, like the Fortuna granite complex, there's the eroded roots of several cupolas yeah. and the spacings on some of them is on the order of two kilometers. So they have, they look like this. We see this is the surface and what we see is a contact looks like that. Uh -huh. And this is the host, right? And it does this and then it's a long ways to the next one. So apparently this spacing is not regular. Yeah. And what controls it is a completely open question. I think it was the question was the width of the dike. Oh, the dike. Well, we, yeah, because yeah. the dike will, if we, if we saw an exposed one, we'd see uh, that the dike system over here, it depends, but it tends to be uh, anywhere from 200, 300 meters to a kilometer, okay. something like that. Yeah. That's this thing. 500 meters would be a good number. Yeah. But like El Salvador, you saw a plug. Yeah. That's unusual. It's usually a dike swarm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I understand the radial fractures, but why do we get orthogonal fractures? Well, the radial fractures. Yeah. So that if you if you if you if this is the, the a plug like thing, uh -huh. and, and uh, like uh, the the Spanish beef dike swarm, or it looks like that, right? And you have a this is. Yeah, the, the fluid makes tensional fractures out that way. So uh -huh. this is like that. And then there's a second set. Uh, if you pick something like that, as those fractures go out, they, go, <coughs> they see the regional stress field, okay? And they tend to bend like that, and they, make, they become sheeted. So this is the sheeted aspect. This is normally what we see above the, this thing. And um, you can think of it as we went back to here. Okay, so uh, if we did this, it's actually pushing out here and it's fracturing that way, making space. And that's generally the case over the top of the cupola as we accumulate bubbles. It's kind of pushing this way, right? It's pushing out. And if we make fractures like this, and we're pushing out that way, we're also pushing this way, so there's a second set like that. Like you're stretching the roof over the top of the cupola. You're right. sending, you're pushing it up, and that cracks it. And it has to be either this one or that one. So it's both work. Make space. Most of these veins that we see are open space filling. So you have to make space for them. They're not actually replacing the rock. And you can figure out how much it is. It's, it, but it's not, not too great. It would be something like it makes 
50 or 100 meters of space that are filled in with these little tiny quartz veins that are a centimeter wide. This is nature's fracking. That's what it is, yes. And one thing that I've found with, with uh, artificial fracking, not I found, but that, that uh, the deeper fracks tend to go more vertical and the shallow fracks go horizontal. So I'm not wondering with your, oh. with your deep stuff versus your shallow model, you, know, you have shallow porphyries and you have deeper porphyries. Do the, do the fractures tend to go more horizontal in the shallower stuff versus the deep stuff? Uh, there's, so I, yeah, I've just been doing two-dimensional right, vertical yeah. fracture. There's always sub-horizontal right. fractures, That's and they're asking. generally yeah. much subordinate to this. But that would tell you the same thing. Either fraction is the fluid pressures exceed the right. static load. Right. They're always present, but it looks like the vertical fractures propagate upwards so fast that you don't you don't propagate horizontal fractures. Right. They're, they're like 1% or less of the okay. fractures look like that. From an economic point of view, how big do, do these have to be these days in order for a company to really be interested? Any idea? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> if it's at the surface and there's lots yeah. of infrastructure <laughs> and, yeah. and you can get to it and you have water and no environmental things, <laughs> you can mine 0.3 to 0.4 copper through a conventional mill. Weight percent copper, and who knows the copper price? Three dollars a pound, roughly, something like okay. that. So yeah, so one percent. Say it's 0.4. One percent copper is 20 pounds. 0.4 is eight pounds. It's yeah. worth about 25 bucks. That's what it costs. And if it's oxide and they don't have to crush it or mill it, it's something like 0.2, which is mainly the cost of moving the rock and the reclamation. If it's underground, you can double the grade because of the uh, cost of developing underground blockade, probably close to 1% copper. And what's the general uh, concentration? That what, half to 1%, okay. that's the kind of range. Seems like a slim margin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the copper mining companies are mining, well, copper gold mining companies in general for the last 30 years have been less profitable than most of the other big companies in the West, which is why they don't invest in places like here, right? Yeah. If you were Intel, you would give a lot of money, but their profits look a lot better. So, yeah. uh, uh, just a quick question. Uh, when you say the Butte Corporate Complex, that's the one responsible for the Berkeley Pit, right? Yeah. That's the one. That, yeah. Um, this is this is a question I've always had for mining: Is the cost of the copper that is has been pulled out will that actually equal the amount that the reclamation will eventually oh, yeah. cost? Way bigger. <laughs> the reclamation is going to be. Well, so that the, the main stage no, veins no, no, no. are worth okay. ten million tons of copper, so that's 20 plus billion pounds yeah. of copper. It, yeah. It's on, so $3 is $60, so the number is for Butte is about uh, $100 billion worth of metal. All right. The environmental liability is a few billion. Depends on how you do it. You know, they don't want to pay for that. Arco doesn't want to pay for it. So. <laughs> uh, it might. I mean, at the outside, it would be ten billion. That's not filling the pits. Laws. It's, what's that? The old laws. What's that? The old laws separate the profit from the liability. That's right. Too much. This is an unfortunate yeah. thing. If you ever have a chance to lobby, tell them that they should have a two percent mining royalty on everything, and half of it goes into an environmental fund. And if they clean up to the standards, they get it back. And if they don't, there's money to clean things up. And it would be something like that is what the U.S. should be doing. But we have enough political problems without mining. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, at any, any rate, it would if it, you would you would say that when they mine, it was the largest <laughs> copper mine in the world from about 1880 to 1920. 
and it wired the U.S. and it made it, it created the industrial revolution. We can afford to pay for that, no doubt. You know, we wouldn't have the economy we have today if we didn't have the enormous amount of copper. We have other problems. <laughs> yeah. John, a few of us have mapped um, in Nevada and, yep. and elsewhere and seen these quartz ledges. Uh, Are those the sealed quartz veins that you were talking about? Is that what we're seeing? Let's see. So like like an Ann Mason there? or yeah. or the forest mine? Yeah. Um, so that would be the epithermal environment, mm -hmm. right? Where And the thing about the epithermal environment <coughs> is in that area, the fracture permeability will be on faults or or a single you mean uh, shallower, right? shallow environment. And so the fluid flow that's deep is distributed in a lot of fractures. And as you go higher and higher, it tends to go into faults that are more permeable. And then it makes big quartz ledges. Okay. And you could do the you could do a calculation of how much water went through there. The width of that vein and the volume tells you how much water went through. It's right. an enormous amount, but it gets focused, right? Closer because the, the upper crustal permeability is way more heterogeneous than okay. stuff at this level. But they, these, even at Yarrington, the higher you go, you start seeing quartz veins and ribs higher up, and big blocks of rock in between that are not so altered. Okay. What about like at Lassen, who we were in the Silver Rose area? Is oh, right. Some quartz ledges. Is that the same? Yeah, okay. yeah, that would be shallow. Yeah. There are some little stocks which will make in there that will, the fracture permeability makes smaller veins that's in the granitic rock. We'll let everybody go, I think. Yeah, uh, so we have a, uh, uh, we have a cleared meal in room 220. You're welcome to come to interact with John. And uh, thank you very much for coming next week. Same time, same place. Uh, please come back. Let's thank Dr. Dillis for that.